No, we can't see your screen. We are not able to. All right. Just one moment. There. Okay. okay. Yes. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. That should be. That's my grand. One of my grandchildren. All right. There we go. Okay. Well, uh, I will. I know your audience has already picked up on the fact that Zoom is uh, tending to crash today. And I think part of that is that it is uh, something that has been only recently discovered during the pandemic that uh, the number of people who use Zoom now has increased by a factor of uh, thousands. And so uh, lots of families like this morning we were communicating with my grandchildren uh, actually through Skype rather than Zoom. Uh, but it's the way that families have to communicate right now until the pandemic uh, subsides or we get a vaccine. On to the topic for today. Uh, what I want to do is visit um, some of the uh, more salient topics in uh, the new book that I've just published, which is Dental Facial Aesthetics from Macro to Micro. I began the terminology macro, mini, micro many years ago, uh, maybe as many as 15 when it first germinated. Uh, but uh, in any event, uh, I have been to India and that was in the year 212. And so I picked some of the photographs uh, from that meeting uh, that were taken and a number of the friends that I made while I was there. Uh, there's R.A. who's sitting next to me, and um, uh, my wife, uh, Valerie, was with me. And we visited some of the more iconic places in uh, India and enjoyed uh, some of the uh, hospitality uh, that we had in that uh, beautiful country. And, of course, we uh, always had to, had to get our picture made in front of the Taj Mahal, and this is a picture with uh, Dr. Krishnawami and uh, Bertie Nelson, uh, and then the uh, ending of the meeting. What I want to talk about today, there's a quote by Marcel Proust. The real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. Now, the reason I choose that quote is that what I want to do uh, Today And one of the purposes of the book is I think that orthodox is a, uh, and always will be, a very changing profession. And that's what makes it engaging. That's what makes it interesting to us. But what I want to do today is, is have you see things the way that I see them? And uh, the question becomes one of how do you see through new eyes? Well, the first thing is don't go straight to the teeth, you know. Start from the outside in. You know, assess your patient's appearance when you first meet them. Focus on the clinical examination, which I will show you in great detail. And then ultimately, rather than just focusing on the problems that the patient presents, let's focus on the goals of treatment. Orthodontics is an option. It's not necessary. So very often the, what the patient wants and what we want may be two different things. It may be that the patient doesn't understand what we know. And so that's one of my uh, intentions today is to show you how I communicate with patients uh, so that they can see what I see. It starts with a clinical examination uh, and we start from the outside and we go to the inside. Now, orthodontics has changed uh, as I had alluded to uh, Dr. Prophet as my editor, you know, he and I have traveled a path uh, through my entire 40 year time with him that we have gone from uh, what we uh, termed the angle paradigm to the soft tissue paradigm. In other words, we concentrate more uh, than we ever have on not only the hard tissue relationships, but also the hard, hard tissue. And so we want to talk about its evolution and impact on today's orthodontics. When I went to grade school, you know, we had to learn the rules and that's how you got good grades. We went to dental school. That's how we got good grades is we answered the questions the way the professors wanted to hear them answered. We didn't, uh, weren't allowed very often to challenge thinking. That's one of the things I loved about 
my, my uh, education by Dr. Private was not only did he uh, not discourage uh, challenging ideas, he encouraged it. And so the rules have changed. And so what has changed? Well, what has changed is what we are taught. Here's what I was taught in dental school as a dental student. Um, what I was taught was in, on this block of wood you see here. This was handed to me in my orthodontic course and it had all these nails driven in here. And my task was to bend a wire to touch each one of those nails. And I was graded on how closely I got to them. And so when you ask me, what did I learn in my orthodontic teaching in dental school? And the answer is uh, really not very much that uh, has to do with orthodontics, but I got a really nice Christmas decoration out of it. Okay, in the form of a star. Well, what are the shortcomings of treatment planning as I was taught? Well, I was taught to base my treatment planning on the models and the cephalogram. And I got to thinking about it back in the 80s. The cephalogram is 1 60th of a second. It's in one plane of space, which is the mid sagittal plane. Uh, and I'm supposed to make decisions that affect this kid for life. Uh, and, you know, uh, make them look good and make their teeth fit well. So let's visit the history of uh, cephalometric diagnosis. Uh, cephalometry was the brainchild of Holly Broadbent at Case Western University. And this is what he uh, uh, defined the use of cephalometric uh, as quantification of growth, maturational and aging changes, uh, next, he uh, used it for cross-sectional and longitudinal research, which you will see uh, later on in this presentation. And he also used it, uh, uh, saw it as a way to quantify his treatment response. To me, that is what we use cephalometrics for, is to quantify growth research and treatment response. That's what I use it for. As a diagnostic tool, I'm going to demonstrate to you how I use the clinical exam much more than I do the cephalometric analysis. Uh, Alan Brody, who was one of uh, his uh, collaborators in 1949, said in the uh, 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 Journal of Oral Surgery, cephalometrics was never intended as the sole decision maker in orthodontic treatment plans that its main strength was in quantification of growth and research. That emphasizes kind of what I just said. So let's talk about goal-oriented treatment planning. And, um, you know, we, we in treatment planning, uh, start with a problem list, and we then outline our solutions. And what we propose is the uh, possibility of, rather than just focusing on the problems, as part of the clinical exam, what I want to do is uh, go through the uh, positive attributes and uh, make note of what they are, because they are, uh, if we focus only on the problems, some of the movements we make may uh, uh, hurt some of the positive attributes that we want to protect. That's what I call treatment optimization, which is a computer term, which means like when your computer crashed in hard drive days, uh, and it would be spinning, uh, what it was doing was optimizing the disk, which is throwing away the bad files and keeping the good ones. And that's what treatment planning is to me, is uh, throwing away the, the problems and keeping the things that are good about it. And so that establishes the goals of treatment. Many years ago, I made a visit to Barcelona and I was touring the uh, works of Antonio Gaudi, a world famous architect. And what the guide said really stuck, uh, stuck with me. She said, his philosophy one was that one must have an appreciation of the work in its entirety and begin with a vision of, the, uh, uh, of what you want to project and start on the outside and work your way in. And so he not only designed the exterior, he designed the interior. Now in today's world, we tend to focus quite a bit on smiles, which is only a part of the big picture. I tell the story about, I was on a ski trip out Western United States and I was on a 30 minute gondola ride from the bottom of the mountain to the top of the mountain. And there was a young lady in the uh, gondola who was taking selfies. And in the 30 minute ride from the bottom of the mountain to the top, she took 28 different views of herself with 
a camera. All right. So what has really uh, contributed a lot to people's interest in their appearance and in their smiles has been what you're just looking at right there is that. Now, I want to emphasize one thing that uh, I have learned uh, very much from uh, cosmetic dentistry, that if you think about the history of orthodontics, angles started off with the position of the maxillary molar and the key ridge. As we went through the cephalometric era, uh, era of Steiner and Dewey and all that, we focused on the position of the lower incisor. In today's world, it is the maxillary incisal edge position that drives the treatment plan. Now for cosmetic dentists, it's a vertical thing. For orthodontists, it is horizontal and vertical. In other words, we can affect that way, we can affect that way, we can affect that way. Uh, and they are a little bit more limited than we are. So what I've done is I've established uh, what I'm turning protocols to optimize the face and smile for a lifetime. And that's what we're going to go through today is, is the summary of what I term the mini aesthetic exam. Uh, I have it in computer format, which I'll show you the data from that, uh, but I also have it in PDF form uh, that uh, is, uh, I can make it available to you uh, by email or uh, it is in the uh, uh, new book if you are able to get a copy of it. All right, so the, uh, what I'm terming the Sarver protocol, because I always wanted to have my name on something, so I decided that was not a bracket, so I'll put it on a protocol. Well, we start on the outside and work our way in, and let's take, for example, uh, looking at the lower facial height. We have you know, a normal facial height, uh, we have people who have long faces and we have people who have short faces. As orthodontists, we can affect that. We can affect it dramatically. As a matter of fact, the Asian girl you see in the middle that I started off with, started off with a very short face and I lengthened it as I opened her bite as part of my mechanic. Well, why do I start off looking at facial height? Well, number one, I can alter it. And number two, it has linkage to smile design. In other words, the long faced person tends to be more gummy, the short faced person tends to show less upper incisor on smile. So I can link the two together. Midlines, we tend to just kind of go through midlines pretty quickly. <coughs> and, and the fact is it's pretty important for us to pay attention uh, to midlines. And so I look at each one of them, I measure them. This is uh, the idea behind uh, looking at what is um, uh, a, a positive attribute and not uh, harming it by, for example, trying to correct a unilateral class too. Uh, you wanna look at the lower midline to the mandible. If it not, is not coincident with the upper midline, is it a dental problem or is it skeletal? You can determine all these things on your clinical exam. You can't determine that on a cephalogram. Uh, and so you can have mandibular asymmetry or you can have chin. Uh, and if you have mandibular asymmetry, then you're going to see a compensatory cant in the maxilla and um, a tilted smile. Uh, and I look at the lower middle line by having the patient open their mouth and look at the center of the chin. Sometimes the chin can be off target. So that is my view of how to finish the exam and look at the lower middle line to the uh, uh, mid sagittal plane of the face, as well as the upper middle line. We tend to concentrate on that, but all of them count. So the mini aesthetic smile exam sequence. Well, this is the mini aesthetic flow chart and let's kind of um, uh, visit that. Uh, it's the, you know, linchpin of what we do. What I'm presenting to you is the concept that braces move teeth. What I'm presenting to you today, I hope, is how to build a strategy to make a smile, uh, you know, repeatably good. Call it the Sarver smile, call it a, Pitt smile, call it a Damon smile, call it whatever you want. But the fact is, is that you want to build a strategy that consistently gives the patient the smile that they expect when they come in. Let's look at some research that we published a few years ago. Changes in the frontal soft tissue of the lower face by age and sex. And uh, this is a master's thesis by one of our students, uh, uh, Stacy, uh, excuse me, Maggie Law. Uh, and myself and Chung Hao Kao, our uh, chairman, so a collaboration between uh, UAB and my office. 
What I have done since 1990 uh, is incorporate this examination protocol into my practice. So I have measured uh, a number of these measurements that you will see uh, for years. And I've done it in a computer format so that I can analyze what I'm measuring and produce uh, a research outcome. Well, when she went into the records to see what we had, she found 18,000 sets of records uh, that uh, I had measured. About 7,000 of them met the selection criteria. Now, those of you who do research, which I know many of the gentlemen on the panel do, um, that you understand that that sa sample size is an excellent uh, cross-sectional uh, database as opposed to a longitudinal study. Well, I start off with uh, lip support and proportion. We don't think about that uh, except in profile very often, but thin lips are not what people, uh, particularly females, like to have. That's important to them. Denture prosthodontists have known that forever because they have their 65 year old patient come in with a picture of when they were 20 and say, I wanna look like that again. Well, so do I, uh, but you generally have a proportion of uh, one third upper lip, two thirds lower lip. Now I started off by measuring the upper lip length, which is from the base of the columella to the filtral tubercle. And what I found in the measurement of those 7,000 patients, dividing them up into yearly up to age 15 and then going 16 to 20, 21 to 25, five-year increments, as you can see there, that the filtrum increases in height in both males and females, incrementally, virtually the same. Okay, so it's, it's a very um, graded sort of change. Next, I measure uh, the commissure height, which is from the base of the columella to the commissure. And same sort of thing. It lengthens gradually in both males and females. What's important is to take that data and superimpose it. Uh, and so when I, I put the two graphs on top of each other, looking at filtrum length and looking at commissure height, they kind of converge. And so what does that mean to us? Uh, what that means is the filtrum lengthens at a greater rate than does the commissure height and they converge. And what that means is the 21 year old set of lips over the next 40 to 50 years turns into the aged set of lips. So vermilion projection is an important part of the clinical examination. Next step, I measure incisor at rest. And why do I measure that? Well, number one, it is a repeatable measurement. It's not like asking a smile, you know, smiles, you get social smiles, you get repeatable smiles, you get, um, you know, posed smiles, the science of smile analysis. So incisor at rest tells me where that patient's smile is on the clock. And what I found was that uh, up to age 13 to 14, our patients show the most amount of upper incisor, and then it goes downhill from there, which is part of the aging process. In other words, that gives me an idea of where that patient's smile is on the clock. Next, I measure crown height. And what I find is that what we would expect that in the early years, uh, up to 21 to 25, crown height increases, that's active and passive eruption, which we will visit in a moment. <clears throat> but then it levels off. The idea one time someone asked me, you know, what do you think about uh, doing gingivectomies on adolescents and what that does to uh, natural recession of the gums? And the answer is, I don't consider there's such a thing as natural recession of gum, that that is a pathologic uh, condition. And that pretty much verifies that with that data. Next, I measure gingival display on smile. Now you can see the reason I measure crown height is gingival display can be affected by the size of the teeth, the facial height, and I've got an entire checklist that goes with that. So gingival display on smile. Well, if the lips are lengthening, okay, uh, we might expect that uh, we would see less upper tooth. So gingival display maximizes at age 10, which is a function of active passive eruption, which I'll define for you in a little bit. And um, the 
maturation of the surrounding soft tissue. So as we get older and males age more quickly than do um, uh, females, but uh, it happens to both genders that the older you get, the less tooth you show. So what does that mean for us as orthodontists? What that means is that one of our tasks is to place the incisal edge in the most advantageous uh, position to maintain the youthfulness of that smile for as long as possible. Next, I measure the number of millimeters of incisor display on the smile. And that is particularly important in the patient who doesn't show all of their upper tooth on smile. For example, the young lady uh, uh, in the circle that you see is a 12 year old patient. And so what would one of my goals of treatment be? Uh, knowing this data, knowing that uh, the older she gets, the less tooth she's going to show, my goal of treatment is to bring those upper incisors down and get the incisal edges as close to the curvature of the lower lip as possible and get as much incisor display as I can because the data clearly shows that uh, maxillary incisor display on the smile is at its maximum at 25 to 30 and tends to go downhill from there. This happens to be the intraoral picture of the smile you just saw of incomplete incisor display. And you would you know, look at that and say, that is an easy case. If all I'm looking at is those pictures, if I'm starting on the inside, I can treat that with abrasives. I can treat it with aligners. I can even treat it probably with Holly retainers to a degree, but what is the goal of treatment? The goal of treatment is not just to close the spacing that is there. Uh, it is to reduce the proclination of the upper incisors, which uh, you know, uh, improves the incisor display. So in other words, what I would normally think is a chip shot. Bingo, that's Tiger Woods. Okay, that is not a chip shot. That is a hard case. Aligners, fixed appliances, what are the goals of treatment? The goals of treatment are to take that smile which shows incomplete incisor display. I wanna close the space, but I won't also want to increase incisor display. So how do I do that? Well, when I upright proclined incisors, if I do it on round wire and I think about what I'm trying to do, besides so just close the space, then I'm gonna close that on round wire so that it pivots back and changes the vertical relationship of the incisal edge and improves that. Next is I'm going to put the brackets more superiorly than the middle third that all our little charts say that we should put the brackets in the middle third of the tooth. Well, this smile, uh, quite frankly, in today's world, I almost put them on the gingival margin. I want to generally start on the gingival margin because if they're going to live in braces for two years, that creates an oral hygiene issue. So I will start above in the upper third, bring them down, and then reset in the final stages of treatment. So that is where I put her brackets on to begin with. And that is her smile when I am finished. And you can see the amount of extrusion that I have gotten on the uh, maxillary incisors. I have also increased her lower facial height. And so that is an appearance uh, issue here. What I've done is I've not only uh, closed the space, uh, I, which is what they see. I have improved her mini aesthetics with more incisor display on smile, which translates into the picture on the left, uh, which is an appearance. When that smile walks into the room, it gets the attention of everyone. So you can see that extrusion makes a big difference. Now, the next part's a little bit of a mystery. I measure lip length on smile. And so why would I do that? Well, I wanted to answer the question on my checklist of etiologies of uh, the gummy smile. Uh, they can be long face, they can be a short upper lip, they can be short teeth, they can be retroclined maxillary incisors. Uh, but what I wanted to answer was, what exactly is a hypermobile smile? And how do we determine what a hypermobile smile is. So um, many years ago, I asked uh, Dr. Clay McIntyre, who uh, was a UAB dental student doing his honors research under me, who then did his orthodontic training at BCU. He repeated the study we did at UAB at BCU. I'm gonna show you really kind of the 
uh, summary of those findings. We measured the upper lip at rest, okay, which we call A. And then I have the patient smile and I measure that, which I call B. And so B divided by A gives me a ratio of lip mobility and the average for both genders, male and female, averaged about 23%. Well, it had a little bit of a range to it. But the idea is that if you see someone who is gummy, part of your checklist uh, should be, what is the mobility of the upper lip and how much contribution does that have to the smile? You'd say, well, you can't do anything about that. And the answer is, yes, you can. I'm not gonna go into that in this one hour, but there are things that you can do to reduce lip mobility. Finally, I will look at the smile art, which is an artistic concept, which is why I chose Salvador Dali to illustrate it. Uh, you know, the smile arc is a curve and it's hard to measure. It's hard to quantify uh, what a smile arc is. I saw a uh, question on one of my previous webinars where someone asked the question, you know, that he quoted uh, someone's article that said, smile arcs are important to orthodontists and dentists, but not to patients. Quite the contrary. Uh, research done at uh, Ohio State by Henry Fields shows that the number one uh, element that can, and patients don't know what it is, but if you alter smile art, that's the number one thing that patients notice in terms of whether they like a smile or not. Well, that's a lot to go through, you know, but guess what? There's more to do. And, and why is there more to do? Because over my 40 years, I have you know, try to be uh, thoughtful about what I'm doing, try things. If it doesn't work the first time, I will try it again until I get, uh, you know, the tendencies down of what's happening. So the micro aesthetic examination, what you're seeing coming up is taken out of uh, cosmetic dental work and, and the research they have done. And some of it is artistic. Some of it is uh, measurable. The height width ratio, uh, ideally, of the maxillary incisor should be 80% of incisor height should be the width. Uh, so height width ratio is important. Contacts, which is where the teeth touch, it makes the floss pop. Connectors are where the teeth appear to touch, but doesn't grab the floss. There are accepted ratios in cosmetic dentistry for that. 50% ratio between the central incisors uh, and that's 50% of central incisor height, 40% 40% between the centrals and the laterals. That is uh, of central incisor height, and 30% between lateral and canine of central incisor height. So you see where the central incisor uh, tends to drive the plan. Now let me make it clear that not all central incisors are perfectly proportioned. So you know one must exercise your uh, artistic judgment on a lot of these things to uh, get things where you want them. Uh, again, soft tissue, we're going to look at the gingival shape, uh, which is the two-dimensional junction of the gums and the uh, enamel. And we're all used to long, uh, long axis of teeth. Uh, zeniths are the most uh, superior portion of the shape. And on the central incisors, they tend to be ideal, idealized as distal to the long axis and on the Lateral incisors coincident. Uh, now, as orthodontists, that's not always easy for us to get. Uh, gingival embrasures, uh, uh, Stephen Chu out of New York, uh, uh, the only study done on this, uh, shows that a 40% gingival embrasure is ideal. And incisal embrasures tend to be more empirical that go with the idea that the smallest one is at the midline and it gets bigger as it goes towards the posterior. Okay, so after I do the mini aesthetic examination, I then go into the micro aesthetic examination. I do that with a caliper, not a ruler. And the reason for that is accuracy. I measure central incisor width, I measure central incisor height, and that gives me height width ratio. And then what I do is take out a periodontal probe and I measure gingival depth. Why do I measure that as part of my micro aesthetic examination? because of the um, uh, uh, altered active and passive eruption uh, uh, anomalies that we see in particular patients. So what is altered active and passive eruption? Well, we all learned in dental school that you have a one millimeter gingival sulcus, uh, you have one millimeter uh, epithelial attachment, and you have a one millimeter connective tissue attachment, 
which is commonly referred to as the biologic width. And, you know, very often we are taught in middle school that, uh, that uh, you don't want to violate bio biologic width. Well, that is a, a prosthodontic concept. A violation of biologic width is if you put a margin in that area, then it will not heal. Remember that I said that because that's an important part of what we're about to go through. Well, short teeth, there are two basic causes of that. One is what I term gingival encroachment. In other words, the gums are down too far. And the other is what cosmetic dentists talk a lot about is incisal wear. What is normal eruption and gingival maturation look like? Well, normally you will see the, after the tooth has completed both active and passive eruption. Well, first of all, let's define what those are. Active eruption is the eruption of the tooth out of alveolar bone to its mature position. Passive eruption is the movement of the gingival tissues more apically to its mature position. That's active and passive eruption. In what is considered normal, the bone is one millimeters, uh, one to two millimeters apical to the cemento enamel junction. You have a two millimeter biologic width, which is made up of the epithelial attachment and gingival attachment. All right, and what you see then is the one millimeter of connective tissue and epithelial attachment, then that places where the gingival tissue is. And I think Zoom just crashed on us here. And so let me see if I can recover from that. Hello. Sorry, I think there must be some uh, technical errors at uh, Dr. Sarvas and probably his uh, Zoom has been crashing since uh, morning. That's what he's been telling. So please bear with us until he comes back and we'll fix it. Dr. Sarvas, are you there? There must be Zoom some problem, Dr. Ajay. He'll join us. Yes, yes, he's joining. So detailed and excellent uh, information so far. Yes. So many cases, so many records. Dr. Anarka sir will be able to say more in the end, maybe. Mm -hmm. Sir, so you need to uh, mu uh, unmute yourself, sir. Uh, I think uh, we have seen most of it is in the book, but nothing like hearing from him and you know the way he goes about it. His presentation skills are fabulous. And I think the artwork is something very phenomenal, you know, it makes it uh, very easy for people to understand. I only hope that he'd be able to reconnect and be with us soon. Otherwise, it'd be very disappointing. Let me just try connecting with him. Yeah, I just had a word with him and uh, he's rebooting his system and he'll be back with us within a second. So please bear with us. Meanwhile, if you can have some questions, you can just write it in a question and answer section and we'll be appreciate if those are the relevant questions. We'll take a few questions until the time permits and until uh, Dr. David Sauer has some time. Uh, thank you so much, all of you. Dr. Zakir, how is the situation, COVID situation uh, there in your country? Sir, you, know, you, need to, you need to unmute yourself. 
Pardon? Yeah. Okay, okay. Now, how is the situation there, Dr. Jacket? Very dangerous, serious. Today is the highest percentage of infection rate. Oh. 24%. Oh, not in Dhaka <laughs> or everywhere in Bangladesh. Overall in Bangladesh, Dhaka is the most hot spot. Dhaka and the vicinity area. So, is there a lockdown, sir? No, no. It's part of the city. Part of the city, not all city. Okay. So we are afraid of uh, uh, during uh, next Eid. You know, Eid, Bangladesh, Holy Kurbani. That will be a big massacre. Oh, Dr. Sarwar is here with us. Uh, Thank you, area. sir. I'm back, I think. Yep. Let's try sharing your screen, sir. Yep. Uh, hang on just a second. <clears throat> and uh, let me get to that. And share screen. And I will share that screen. And yes, I'll... yes, it's visible. Okay. That's your appointment. There you go. I hope it doesn't happen again. Okay, so we had gone through normal eruption and uh, gingival maturation. All right, so next one I want to do is uh, kind of go through. Uh, altered active eruption. And that is where the tooth eruption is complete and the teeth are completely out of the alveolus, but the bone is at or coronal to the CEJ. In other words, the uh, dotted line is supposed to be at the uh, bone margin and it, in reality, the bone is at the CEJ, uh, revealing the normal anatomical crown. And then uh, the blue represents bone and the red represents the gingival tissues with uh, one to two millimeters of uh, uh, biologic width and one millimeter of gingival uh, cut. And that gives you a short clinical crown. And the way you determine that is with periodontal probe showing you one millimeter or two of depth. Altered passive eruption, which is where the bone is in the right place, CJ is in the right place. You've got two millimeters of uh, 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 biologic width, but when you probe, you get a, for example, here, a four millimeter probe depth. In other words, the gingival tissues have not uh, migrated back to their adult position. So think about it this way. Altered active eruption is a hard tissue problem. Altered passive eruption is a soft tissue problem. CEJ and bone are normal, uh, but the soft tissues are located too far incisally. And because altered passive eruption is a soft tissue problem, a gingivectomy will work on that. But if you have altered active eruption, gingivectomy is often not stable. And that goes in my book, easily said, I can do a uh, gingivectomy uh, in my clinic with diode lasers, what I use, but um, uh, electrosurgery, there are ceramic burrs, there are lots of things available to do that. But if I determine it to be altered active eruption, that goes to the periodontist. I'm not going to treat that. Uh, the reason for that is biologic width will reestablish itself coronal to the osseous crest after a gingivectomy resulting in short crowns again. Well, one of the things I did uh, early on, these are photographs I took every year on one of my daughters from ages five to 15. And it shows very clearly active and passive eruption. You note the canine is coming in, that's active eruption. Watch on all of the teeth, how the teeth get longer, that is passive eruption. What effect does that have on smile? Here she is at age five. Of course, my wife is afraid I'm gonna do a little fort one osteotomy on her at that time. Age eight, age nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. That is active and passive eruption. Okay, well, uh, so you can show me why you bother to do that, I hope, you know, because that takes a lot of time to go through that measurements. Well, it really takes about a minute, really. 
but you know, in a busy orthodontic clinic, that seems like a lot of time. Well, let me illustrate that with Tiffany. Many of you may have seen this one already. I published her in the American Journal of Orthodontics, but uh, as all things, it is better uh, understood if explained than read. Um, she came in, typically what we see, the dentist said she needs braces. Uh, and so got a class two deep bite. That's my job as the orthodontist is to fix, fix the class two deep bite. Well, starting from the outside in, I noted that she had a short lower facial third, and that translates into information to me. Uh, next, when we measure facial width and height, uh, that gives us a, a inappropriate, uh, basically a short lower facial height. On profile, she is slightly mandibular deficient, and so you see that her maxillary incisors are retroclined in compensation for the mandibular deficiency. You can tell that on a cephalogram, but I can also see that clinically. I'm not saying I don't use cephalometrics, but I use it for what Broadbent said that was for. Um, many aesthetic evaluation, let's go right through that. Filstrom and commissure height. Her Filstrom height was 15, her commissure height was 22. Does that mean it's been that way all her life? No, but that is what I note at age uh, ended up being uh, eight millimeters. And I know that as she gets older, she's gonna show less incisor display at rest. Microesthetic evaluation. She has eight millimeter uh, uh, anatomical crown, excuse me, that would be uh, clinical crown height. And she has a width of nine millimeters, which is not the appropriate uh, width that we want or, or uh, ratio. If you notice, she has very thick gingival tissue. That's called a thick periodontal phenotype. And that's important for you to know. Zeniths are located very distally. The thick periodontal phenotype is one that has uh, issues with passive eruption. I measure incisor display on smile, and that is eight millimeters, as you've already seen. Gingival display is five millimeters. So why does she have the gummy smile? Well, I know that for one thing, it's gonna get better uh, just with time. Will a gummy smile of that magnitude get good enough? And the answer is, I don't know, only time will tell. There's a book called The Checklist Manifesto, which um, uh, uh, was, and I got corrected actually in 2012 when I was in India, I didn't know how to pronounce uh, Atul Gawande's name, but I got corrected uh, by one of my colleagues because uh, I didn't know how to pronounce that name. But he is a, a surgeon in Boston who uh, basically eliminated 75% of the complications in the operating room and in the hospital by creating checklists, which are as follows. These are the etiologies of gummy smile that I have outlined. And, um, you know, it seems very complicated, but I'm going to show you how really it's quite easy that she has a short face, which means she's not vertical maxillary excess. She has a um, short filtrum. I've already measured that. Uh, in measuring crown height, uh, I note that she has, you know, again, the short filtrum, but her crown height, uh, she has short clinical crown height. It's up to me as a clinician to determine is that because she has anatomically small teeth, does she have wear and attrition, or does she have altered active, passive, or just plain uh, gingival hypertrophy? I can see the retroclined maxillary incisors on profile. I determined that she had altered passive eruption. And when you look at her on profile, you can see that she has retroclined maxillary incisors. I didn't measure hypomobile smile when I treated her, but here you have how I use the checklist manifesto that defines the goals of treatment and the problems for me that she, the goal is gummy smile, you know, in terms of aesthetics, the goal is to correct the class two deep bite. But here's my checklist of, I know it's not a VME, I know it's all these other things. So incisor height, eight millimeters, gingival slate, five millimeters, buccal corridor, I uh, deem as excessive. Smile arc, incisal edge placement is ideal. I don't want to intrude those incisors, which as orthodontists we think, well, I want to intrude the upper incisors to decrease gingival display. Incisal edge position is ideal. So I don't want to do that. That's going to flatten the smile arc. 
So how am I gonna open her deep bite? I'm gonna open it with reverse curve mechanics to cause extrusion, which increases facial height, but does not affect incisal edge position. So here she is uh, when uh, we were about six months remaining in treatment. And the question is, is that a simple gingivectomy to get proper crown height? And then that follows with, how do I know whether I should send her to the periodontist or I can do that within uh, the confines of my clinic. Well, this is her, I'm not quite finished getting the bite open, but the important part is I take the periodontal probe and I probe the pocket depths and she probes to be only two millimeters thick. Off to the periodontist. That is not something I can uh, help her with with uh, crown lengthening with simple gingivectomy. Here's the picture from the periodontist, which explains why that he measured the crown to be eight millimeters in height, uh, 9.5 in width. So if we have 8.5 in height with what I measured uh, and I probe and I find that I've only got two millimeters of gingival depth, then if I do a gingivectomy all the way down to crestal bone, then I can get two millimeters. But when it heals and reestablishes the gingival apparatus, I get a net gain of one, all right, which then makes my height width ratio 9.5 to 9.5, which is not 80%. It is not ideal. So you see how you systematically determine what you are going to do for treatment. Let's talk about opening the deep bite again. There are a number of ways to open a deep bite. One is posterior dental alveolar extrusion, which increases lower facial height. You can do that with uh, bite plates, you can do that with uh, functional appliances, or you can do it mechanically with orthodontic fixed appliances. Next, you can uh, intrude incisors. You can intrude maxillary incisors or mandibular incisors. And you can procline upper incisors. Well, these are the pictures that, of this patient that the periodontist sent me showing that there, uh, uh, right there is the CEJ is in yellow, crustal bone is in white. And so she has uh, incomplete active eruption because the bone is apical to the CEJ. So what the periodontist does is not only removes the amount of bone to the CEJ, but he goes two millimeters above that. And why did he do that? Because when it heals, it has to have two millimeters of room for uh, biologic width and then one millimeter for uh, the sulcus. So here she is after I uh, finished her treatment. She has had periodontal crown lengthening done with a periodontist. That was her before and that was her finished. Well, she's still gummy. She's 14. Remember the data, as she gets older, she's gonna show less gum. So what does that mean? That means I'm gonna leave her right where she is. To me, that is almost the ideal 14 year old smile. It will age well. Well, prove it. There she is at 14. There she is at 19. There she is at age 27. And you can see that she now shows virtually no gingival display on the smile. So what I have done is I have protected the youthfulness of her smile. These are the superimpositions of her treatment. You can see that I keep the incisal edge where it is supposed to be. And I use reverse curve arch wires in the lower arch and open the deep bite with posterior extrusion. And, you know, even though you don't see brackets on the upper teeth, uh, these pictures were taken before, uh, you know, when I took brackets off for uh, uh, gingivectomy. Here she is during the treatment and growth process. I'm opening her bite. I then refer her for crown lengthening. And then I finish, there she is. And here she is by the time she is 19 and there by the time she is uh, 27. Well, again, the periodontal probe becomes an important part, not only to determine that, but also if I have a clinical crown height that is short crown height, am I gonna put the bracket in the middle where I normally would, or am I going to put it up here when I probe and see what the real actual height of the tooth is then I know that I'm going to put the back it up more superiorly because, or more apically, I'm sorry, uh, because to put it 
too low, flattens her smile arc, decreases in size or display, which ages the smile and flattens the smile arc. So here is the mini aesthetic exam in order. Uh, that is the flow chart. And that is the uh, summary of the clinical examination. Now we've been interrupted a little bit with one Zoom crash, but I think I'm gonna finish pretty much on time. Uh, and so I know what you already want to ask is who in the heck does all that measurement stuff? Who does that? Well, I do. And I hope you're seeing the value in why you would do that. But an important part of it is your culture and your office. In other words, they have to know why you do that, be able to uh, feel motivated to facilitate that process, but also explain it to patients on what is he doing? I've been to two other orthodontists and nobody did that. You know, why is that important? So starting from the left, Rebecca has been employed 33 years. She's a receptionist, Cynthia, 25 years, receptionist. Trisha, TC, 36 years, 28 years, four years, 30 years, 21 years, 20 years, 20 years, 17 years. Longevity, people who are treated as professionals. Uh, that's because that's what they are. They understand orthodontics. Let me summarize that case and really this whole philosophy. Uh, in a Wayne Gretzky hockey player, quote, I skate to where the puck is going to be, not where it has been. So the previous case you saw that what I saw with my eyes was where she was going to be, not where I just saw her. So let's finish with starting from the outside in. Kind of a story goes with that, and it's a cliche that we've all heard that the railroad, uh, the railroads thought they were in the train business. But what they didn't understand was that they were actually in the transportation business. And so airplanes took over, trains lost out, at least in the United States. Well, do we think we're in the tooth moving business? The answer is no, we are in the people business. So let's look at the face. I've got three choices. I can keep it the same, I can make it better, or I can make it worse. Let me illustrate that. Young lady comes in, brought in by her mother, uh, and she is 12 years old. And when I look at her, her lip proportion is equal, not one third, two thirds. And when she smiles, she has a gummy smile, but she also has a consonant smile arc. The social view, in other words, the 45 degree view, which is how people see each other. They don't usually see each other just face to face and on profile. Most times it's in conversation in a group or in school or in class. Profile, to me, that appears protrusive, but it doesn't matter whether I think it's protrusive. It doesn't matter whether the cephalogram measures to be protrusive. I'll illustrate to you what I'm trying to get at. I take smile pictures on profile for the previous reason of looking at and size or angulation. Okay, well, here she is. Uh, she's got a gummy smile. She's got moderate crowding. She's got a class two uh, deep overbite. Uh, to me, she's protrusive. Uh, question, um, like all orthodontic cases, is she extraction or non-extraction? And how do I determine that? Well, when we look at where she's starting out and I uh, do a periodontal probe, I find that her pocket depths are deep. Five, four, four, five, which means that she has short crown height, which on my checklist for gummy smile is important to know. So here's her smile, I probe, central incisor is four millimeters in depth. So that uh, is the essence of goal-oriented treatment planning versus problem-oriented treatment planning. Well, what are my treatment goals? Well, standard is I've got to correct the class two deep bite and I've got to correct the crowding, but let's take it into the face and the appearance. I want to protect incisal edge position. This is a quote out of an article that a uh, gentleman who worked for one of the companies that I consult to wrote in an article about the importance of that first visit with an orthodontist. In short, as a parent, I want to meet with one clinician who can quickly convince me that they truly care about my child. 
I want to know that they have closely evaluated my child's exact needs. Now, the parent very often doesn't know what that need is. And so our um, goal then is to do this. We want to help them see what you see. So how do you do that? You do it with digital goal setting. This is software I created in 1995 that, you know, what I illustrate is right off the bat on the initial examination. She has short teeth. It's due to uh, uh, altered passive eruption. I would recommend before I even put brackets on gingivectomy, I can blow the picture up so that you can see it in the face. There's lots of data that supports that people want to know how things are going to look in their face, not just in their smile. Very simple to do, not you know perfect, but elegant so that the mother can see left, right, and go, okay, I get it. I much prefer that on the right. Well, let's address the profile. I feel like she's protrusive. How do I illustrate to them to see what I see and to help me see what they see? I move the lips back, just to guess, okay, tidy it up. But you know what? Once that happens, there's a possibility that we will want to, when she gets her wisdom teeth out, have her chin brought forward as well. You know, the sky's the limit on what you might plan to do. All right, so I finished that initial visit and mom says, okay, uh, we would like to uh, have treatment. I left the room. She told the treatment coordinator, you know, we were supposed to get braces on tomorrow at another orthodontist, but I'm gonna cancel it and stay here because there's not one thing he talked about that the other orthodontist has mentioned, which to me is kind of uh, staggering. Here she is the day she gets her braces on uh, with a diode laser, do crown lengthening and get the ideal uh, anatomical height. Uh, in her case, uh, we did agree to take out four premolars. Uh, I happen to use TMA closing loops quite a bit because it's a softer wire uh, and uh, it does not create the moment to force ratio that uh, steel wires do. And so I tend not to dump uh, as much as I did in stainless steel. Here she is uh, finished. That's her smile. Good smile art. The oblique picture, you see the uh, change in lip proportionality. Chin looks better. Did we do her chin? Not yet, because the reduction of protrusion gave her relatively more chin projection. That is her smile, and that's her profile change, a softer, uh, prettier profile. Close up, occlusal result, and decrowding. Well, I know I had to hurry a little bit because of the crash. I hope uh, uh, everything was understandable for you and uh, being a Southerner and uh, as I am, I hope to be seeing you again later. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, here, uh, uh, I would like to play a, a video of your uh, book if I can. Let me just try. If a book could be so compelling and its ideas so exciting that it would change the very lens through which you see your craft and purpose as though for the first time, would you take note? This book, Dental Facial Aesthetics from Macro to Micro, is an evolution of thought on orthodontics formed over 40 years. It promises to broaden your aesthetic eye and inspire treatment decisions that will lead you to a new pinnacle of excellence. The book is beautifully illustrated, with case after case demonstrating Dr. Sarver's passion for helping doctors see what is possible so they can treat it. The mantra of this book is, if you don't uh, see it, you won't treat it. And what I cover really in great detail, macro is the overall appearance of the patient and how they look when they walk in a room. Uh, many is the smile, which is something in, in interdisciplinary care we really focus on. And then of course, micro, uh, a lot of principles that cosmetic dentists understand completely, uh, orthodontists don't. So getting the two to work together, understand the principles of each other, 
you know, the orthodontists were able to finish cases in such a way that the teeth literally look like veneers. The job is well done. To illustrate what you will get out of this book, I'm going to use a morph video of a young lady I had treated over a period of um, eight years in an interdisciplinary fashion uh, where uh, orthodontics was directed to treating all three dimensions of her appearance and smile. This 11-year-old young girl was brought in by her parents uh, seeking really an overall experience, uh, appearance change. Her mother was a hygienist to recognize the value of a beautiful smile, but also uh, having worked with her on other patients. Uh, also understood that the appearance goals were equally as important. Well, looking at her facial height in the beginning, you can see that she has a short lower facial height, and that's not something we very often recognize. And my orthodontics was designed to do two things, to increase the lower facial height. Note here that she doesn't show much upper tooth, so I placed brackets so as to bring the upper teeth down as much as possible. And once I got them down as far as I could go, we had some interim bonding placed and uh, waited until she was of the appropriate age for her dentist to come in and remove the bonding and place porcelain veneers, which then gave her the kind of smile that we really wanted to get. Uh, and you can see that that's a rather outstanding uh, outcome combination of lengthening her face, increasing the size of her display, better teeth. This book has many focal points of emphasis throughout this content from tooth and smile design to facial design. For example, the primary emphasis of the chapter three is on how the cranial facial structures and facial soft tissues grow, mature, and age. And the purpose of this knowledge is year old girl was referred by her pediatric dentist because of her severe crowding and he referred her telling her parents that I would certainly recommend serial extraction of the primary first molars followed by removal of four first premolars. Starting my evaluation from the outside in rather than going directly to her teeth, there are two macroaesthetic issues that influence the direction of treatment that I recommended. These included the lack of lip support as shown on her frontal view and her profile. Her smile was characterized by incomplete and size of display on smile and excessive buccal corridors, even though I didn't know what buccal corridors were at the time. Data clearly shows that over time, the face loses skeletal support and loss of soft tissue volume, the aging process. Knowing this, I elected not to remove teeth, but instead chose to advance her incisors, uh, thus making space for the canines and actually adding to her lip support. But what happened over the ensuing years? Here's the real point to be recognized in this approach to treatment. She had maintained her attractiveness with a beautiful smile and excellent soft tissue support. And this is reflected in her teeth, smile, and facial appearance shown here 30 years later. The point, had we removed the four premolars, I would not have made her any worse, but we would have never known how attractive she came to be and has proved to be for her lifetime. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. It is, uh, I'm just waiting to grab uh, this book. Uh, let's see if this COVID condition uh, get a little eased down and we can get hand on this book as soon as possible because eagerly waiting to see that. And I'm sure many of my panelists as well as uh, the other audience would be eager to see this book as well. Well, it's uh, now available on Amazon when it wasn't before because of the COVID but they, you know, they were so busy uh, taking care of toilet paper that uh, uh, is now available on Amazon. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, and I'm, I'm really, really amazed to see like for almost 20, and 20, 20 to 22 years, you have been following that same patient for so many years and you have all the documentation. That's amazing. I'm, I'm sure this residents are just uh, seeing this and, and it would be really great to learn this, that uh, if you have documentation, uh, I think you can learn from own, your own success and your own failures. So amazing, sir, amazing. Thank you uh, so that's much. That's a good good comment to make that um, uh, if, if you're not looking at what you're doing, you don't learn. Exactly. You're doing the same thing all your life. And so exactly. thank you for saying that. 
it's it's like it's like running on a treadmill you are at the same place even if you're running too much <laughs> right uh, i would i would advise our panelists to have some word uh, dr nr krishna swami sir uh, it would be an honor if you can just have some word dave thank you so much for a very lucid presentation it's been wonderful listening to you any number of times but let me ask you this i've listened to you so many times and you've come up with new ideas and you know you must be credited for you know sort of introducing the importance of the soft tissue the words like macro micro and mini or something that you brought into orthodontics and i'm certain that you are now treating the fourth generation if not the third so where do you think we are headed for as a profession or what do you think is the, the next 10 15 years a long haul well we're being influenced so much by uh the commercial side that most education in orthodontics in the US is now put on by companies not by universities and so forth in other words like a university program might draw 80 um a company program will draw 1000 and so that's my concern is that our our eyes will get away from what we do to uh what we what we do uh and Uh, so the future to me uh, is, uh, you know, kind of unclear uh, because of uh, uh, two things. One is the commercialization, uh, of which I've been consultants to companies. Don't get me wrong, but number two is in our country, uh, student debt is greatly influencing what student options are when they finish. I was lucky to be able to start my own practice, eliminate my debt, and then run my career the way I wanted to. Okay, I could experiment. I could decide. I could say, okay, in in like 1883, I'm going to take excellent facial photographs. I decided that in 1983, and I'm going to take them consistently all my career. Didn't know that I was going to do more videos. didn't know I'd be talking to you today but it just seemed like that was the important thing to do and I was able to follow what I wanted to do and so that is my concern uh uh right, in in our is that the dar on uh student debt and you know, the kids getting out of school um uh, are having to go into jobs And so I'm hoping we can as a profession create something that takes care of that problem but maintains the professionalism of what we do. And by professionalism I mean what you just saw. What you just saw in that book is a 40 year um you know commitment to our profession. Not so much that for our profession but for me because I wanted to. I had the choice. And so I'm afraid that may be what uh is going to be a problem for us in the long haul is that I'm going to do a liner therapy because it is um fast, it's easy. Um it makes the patient happy. The patient doesn't know what we just talked about. And I think that's the important part is that we have to as professionals accept our responsibility that We're not there to sell things. We're there to be a professional um, counselor, and I know that sounds very deep, but that's what I feel: is that our job is not to sell the liners. It is to counsel the patient on what their options are and help them decide what they want to do. And also, if what they want to do is bad for them, to have the courage to say, "Wouldn't recommend that. Won't do it." Does that sort of make sense? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> got me on a got me on a roll there. I, if I may ask you one more thing because there are a lot of uh, students here they have well over 600 participants and the one thing that is uppermost in everybody's mind is these kind of aligners. You know yes. over the years you have never uh, I've never heard you speak for a bracket or you know particular technique or uh, you're not somebody who speaks about mechanics but you sell uh, ideas you know you put this in people's mind and you want so there is a general fear that with these aligners coming in a big way the role of orthodontists is going to diminish and rightfully so they probably feel that 
you know, you're going to buy aligners and you're just going to dish it to the patients. You know, that, that's a fear that is lurking in everybody's mind. So what's your thought on that? Well, um, I, I do a significant amount of aligners, but um, to me, it's the, all about is the appropriate treatment choice. Can I uh, accomplish what I want to accomplish? Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of uh, Dr. Maz Moshiri from St. Louis, who is, is really a young up and coming guy. He and I have connected, you know, and, and because uh, we're, we're members of the Angle Society, he's just come in. And we had a long conversation. Uh, I'd given a lecture and he said, you know, I'm, I, I, I don't see, I have not been looking at what you talked about. And we made an agreement that what I would like to know, you know how to use aligners better than anybody on the planet. Okay. I want to know how to do what I want to do with aligners. Okay. But conversely, I want people who want to do all aligners to recognize what they're not doing. And so he and I literally talk once a week uh, about, um, you know, that, that idea that we're trying to do what's right, not what's fashionable. Thanks, Dave. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Krishna Swami, sir, for your wonderful points to ponder. Uh, I would request uh, Dr. Silju Matthew also to uh, have some word, please. You please unmute yourself. Thank you, Dr. Ajay. And uh, let me congratulate uh, Dr. David sir for a wonderful presentation. I think you took us to a journey of aesthetics, uh, which is uh, really enlightened us uh, to the importance of uh, cosmetics in orthodontics. And uh, I just have a question, and that is, uh, I mean, you have a micro-sized aesthetic component in orthodontics. What are the metrics of measurements uh, for these uh, incisors? And what are the kind of uh, tools that you use uh, to establish them? Well, as I've shown, I, I use a, a, a digital micrometer to measure height width. Perio probe to measure gingival depth. There are ranges of what is considered normal. Uh, and for me, that's a basic kind of issue in that, um, let me go back to self metrics. We tend to treat to norms. Well, I don't have patients coming in who want to look normal unless they start off hideous. They want to look exceptional, all right, which is not middle of the line. All right, so that I think my task is to measure things carefully, relate them to what is average and what is my goal and how would I alter the measurement I made to get better. Um, and so that's where a lot of interdisciplinary work comes in where I need a cosmetic dentist to help me with tooth sizes. I do a lot of tooth reshaping. The tooth's too big. I'll reshape it. If it's too small, I'll rebuild, I'll build it up temporarily so that I can get the tooth in ideal position. And then I'll have the cosmetic dentist do a final restoration. It's a, at the end of the day, it's a team effort and uh, it involves a lot of people. So thank you so much. Uh, it was really nice thank uh, talking to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Silju Matthew, sir. Dr. Sri Krishna Chalsani. Uh, it would be uh, great if you can just have some inputs from you as well. Dr. David, really it's an excellent uh, talk. After 2012, again I'm seeing you. You are still the same. There are three things I would like to mention here. I won't take much time. One, I remember, hope if I'm wrong, correct me. 18227 records and 6900 records met the match, right? All right, say that again. 18227 records you have taken and 6900 records matched. Wow. Phenomenal, those records maintenance. Phenomenal, the records maintenance. One of your slides showed. Yeah. That's uh, great. And when Dr. Anarke sir said, uh, Dr. Dave, for a moment, I was wondering whether he was addressing to your son. <laughs> and uh, third I, thing. I, I, I had a. Uh, 
new patient came in where I, I entered the room and the uh, lady was a teacher at a local school and she had heard my name for about forever. And she came in and I, and I, when I walked into the room and she's looking at me and she goes, are you Dr. Sarver the father or Dr. Sarver the son? <laughs> my, my, my son is an interventional radiologist. So in other words, he works on you when you're having a stroke, a heart attack, or a kidney failure. And I said, no, I'm Dr. Sarver, the father. If you want to see Dr. Sarver, the son, you are in serious trouble. <laughs> so thank you for your compliment. Nice one. There are many questions. I think Dr. Ajay will take over. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you so much, Dr. Shri Krishna. Uh, we'll take five questions. We'll not take much of your time because it's a Saturday morning for you. And uh, I don't want to bug you with so many questions. So I'll take a few of the relevant questions. Uh, There's a question from Dr. Amruta. She's asking, which is the most predictable and reliable method to measure incisor display at rest that you prefer? What I do is I, I have the patient, you know, Bjorn Zacherson, if you remember that name, used to have his patient say, Emma, 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 and then pause. Uh, in the Southern United States, when I would ask a patient to say, Emma, 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 they would go, wow. You know, and so what I do now is I just uh, measure the upper lip and while they're relaxed, I'll ask them to open just slightly, not so much that it pulls the upper lip down, but just slightly and measure incisor at rest. Uh, and so that's how I determine that. And it's a, it's a ruler of measurement, it's not a micrometer. As soon as you bring out a big micrometer, you know, they're like that. So you have to kind of catch them off guard. Okay. Uh, there's another question from Dr. B.C. Karunakar. He's asking, sir, what is your opinion on extraction for face, not for space concepts? Thank you. Um, extraction for space, uh, for face, not for the space concept. Well, uh, you know, I think you saw two cases that illustrated it pretty well. The young black girl who uh, extracted to reduce protrusion, okay, didn't have anything to do with the crowding, didn't have anything to do with all that. But then the very last case that had 30 year records on it, where she started out very flat faced, I, I, I advanced her incisors, which in 1983 was failure of the American Board of Orthodontics to do that. And so when I took the American Board of Orthodontics exam in 1988, it speaks probably to my personality that I brought that case to see if they would funk me. And they didn't, to their credit. They did, however, challenge me, why did you do that? And I answered, uh, look at the face. And they said, you passed. Um, I think really uh, extraction decision um, requires a, a broader description of, uh, for example, an open bite. I may extract to close an open bite, but it's gotta be protrusive. It can't be retrusive. So there, there are so many factors that determine whether I take out teeth or not that that's really not a very simple answer, quite honestly. I'm not dodging it, it's just very complicated. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's one more question from Dr. Hiral Savani. So which software are you using for face simulation? Is it Adobe Photoshop? No, actually it is a proprietary software that I created for uh, a company in, uh, uh, the U.S. in 1995, uh, and um, it's badly out of date. As we speak, I am meeting Friday with, uh, I have engaged a software company to recreate a program for me that will not be tied to any company except me, and I'm going to put it up in the, crowd, in the cloud so that you can access it from Egypt to Turkey, you know, India, wherever, Alabama, you can access it. I want it to be worldwide. I want it to be usable so that people can then begin to see because it's hard to take all the stuff I talk about and communicate with patients. You can't communicate with patients about crown height doing that. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's a question, sir from Dr. Namrata. 
Can the PDF of server protocol be made available, please? I think it is. It must be given in a book. I think PDF cannot be av made available uh, like that. I am sure because. Yeah, that that's a. Um, it's a copyrighted material, and we shouldn't yeah, be asking. Yeah, it's a complicated question, and, and really, uh, I have in the last ten years had to almost become a paradox. I've had to learn so much about paradox, and paradox has been changing as much as we have. Uh, and so it's uh, uh, been really important to me. I joined uh, here in the US, the American Academy of Aesthetic Dentistry, which is dentists. And I go to, uh, I'm a fellow, I'm on their board. I immediately got sucked into all kinds of things because from their viewpoint, they needed more orthodontic input. They wanted to know what they were to not stop. And I have learned tons uh, during that. And so I always encourage orthodontists that, you know, start joining and going to or, or meetings of what dentists are doing, because there's a lot of things they're doing that they think they're doing well, that they really need us to help them do it well. Okay. I'll take uh, only two more questions, sir. One is from right. Dr. Augusto Macedo. Uh, Dr. Sarah, how can we measure the hypermobility of the upper lip? You measure upper lip at rest, upper lip on smile, and you divide A, which is rest, by B, which is the length on smile, you get a ratio. Okay. Uh, last question is from Dr. Pedro Costillo. Have you measured or recorded how stable is the posterior extrusion to increase the facial height? in short face patients with the strong muscles? You know, there's quite a number of patients in, uh, excuse me, papers in our literature uh, that address that. And I think what I would do is make a general statement that uh, obviously in the long face patient, I would not want to extrude posterior, posterior teeth because it makes the face longer and it also creates an open bite. In the low angle patient, uh, that is the most difficult thing to do. Uh, so very often I will have to compromise, imagine that in the low angle, uh, uh, you know, studies that Profit did years ago, bike force studies showed that the high angle patient generates, I think it's like one sixth the force that a normal mesofacial person generates and the uh, uh, low angle case something like six times greater biting force. So I think we all know as orthodontists from experience that it's hard to open a deep bite on a square face, low angle individual. So I do more intrusion, but what about facial height? Do I just have to ignore that? No, in my world, I'll say I can't make your face longer with braces, but I can have your chin moved down. You know, when, and, and a lot of times I'll have it done when they get their wisdom teeth out. So it's all done in one procedure. Patient's acceptance of that is, uh, the key to it is having the video uh, or the image modification capability to say, if we lengthen your face, this is what you would look like. That's critical and they'll go, yes or no. Thank you. Uh, sir, I have personally have one question. Uh, what is like, what should be treated first, micro, macro, or mini? Uh, probably mini. Okay. Yeah, so start mini, there. Mini, you start with the mini, then you do macro uh, and do micro? Well, you know, me, I start with macro. I, I go macro, mini, micro. Okay. I have changed my in office course to not include very much on macro because most orthodontists don't want to, they're, they're not there yet. You know, I'm 40 years down the road. They're not there yet. And they're not terribly interested in it. And so my strategy is to get them to understand mini and micro and how it affects macro and, and, and sort of lead them to that. Uh, so as part of uh, what I plan to do in my uh, last part of my career, I'm going to write another book. 
Uh, I am, however, planning, trying to create a web education, you know, server course that is accessible online uh, and, uh, and multifactorial, not just me, that is truly a uh, educational experience that is non-commercial, uh, you know, is uh, not just David Sarver's view, but heavily influenced by it. Uh, and, and so, but like all things, it takes a little while to pull that together and uh, get finances to have a mechanism to have it online and have it to be a valuable experience to people who participate. Uh, so um, I, I would like to uh, say that that's kind of in my, my plans for the, the I, I'm not saying I'm done yet by any stretch, uh, but I do have other interests to pursue and that's one of them. Okay, sir. Uh, I'll end with one more question from my side. Uh, okay. What's your perspective on the use of clear aligners in children and adolescents and how that could impact the facial aesthetic during growth and development? Do you think that if we use a clear aligner in the uh, young and adolescent, like a uh, uh, growing child and adolescent patients, uh, and can it affect the facial aesthetics in a growing child? It will be beneficial or not? Not much in my opinion. I mean, you, you don't have the same mechanical advantage uh, that you have in extra oral force, um, uh, intra oral forces, and that sort of thing. It's a tooth moving device. Exactly. True. And now, uh, some of that is I live in the southern United States, which is rural. And, you know, uh, to say uh, for a thousand dollars extra, your child can wear Invisalign, that's like, nah, we'll take, we'll take. Metal braces, thank you, doctor. You know, they want so to play it, in the school. Yeah. <laughs> now, in Manhattan Park Avenue, different category. I have a, an associate of mine who practices, she comes down, uh, you know, about every three months and works with me. Uh, and she's on Park Avenue and she does 90% aligners, mostly adults, not very many kids because she agrees with me that that's kind of stupid. <laughs> But, you know, she says, I do it on some if they're willing to pay and it's not hurting them, then I'm offering them something that is, and that's understandable. So you must be practicing since more than 40 years now? 41 years. Oh, wow. It's almost, uh, I, I was two years since you started practicing. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. I, I, don't I, would have like, I would like to go at least uh, 50. That should. I, I I wish that you go as long as possible so that we gain some uh, better knowledge from you and new insight into the uh, newer aesthetics parameters which you might come up after 10 years. We are looking oh, I'm, sure I'm, I'm sure I'll come up with something. <laughs> Dr. Jackie Rosen, can you have a concluding note? I'm so sorry I couldn't see you. So, so you need to mute, you need to unmute yourself. Yeah, okay. Now, now you are audible. Thank you okay. very much. Is it okay? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. you are audible. Uh, it is indeed a very good delivery. I enjoyed it. And I really, it was a very good evening without any dinner and snacks. And <laughs> had a lot of things uh, I could learn and understand. And thank you very much. I think. He can continue his lecture in the future too, and we can attend. As thank, well. you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and thank you, Dr. David Server, sir. It's an honor, uh, you know, hosting you. And, and you, you, you just enlighten everybody in India and across the globe about uh, the importance of uh, aesthetics, facial aesthetics with your own concepts, and it's amazing. We have been following you since we were doing post-graduation and, and it's really an honor to have like you here live with us and I'm hosting you. I think probably I may not be able to sleep tonight. It's, I'm, I'm really overwhelmed with that. Uh, it's really an honor for, and I'm sure it must be same with uh, all of you other than NRK, sir, because he's also a legend. So I cannot say that Dr. NRK would be feeling the same, right? <laughs> so, Thank you. Thanks, Dave. It's been wonderful seeing you and I look forward to listening to you next year.
And yes. get after you. Get after well, you. Well, I hope uh, <laughs> you have an AAO next year. And thank you. Uh, all of you stay safe. Right. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. David. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Jay, Anarke, sir, Shri Krishna, and Dr. Zakir. Stay safe and uh, good night. Dr. Okay. Dr. David, advance the happy birthday. I'm, I'll be waiting for your cake on first. <laughs> That's the birthday man. <laughs> I'm, I'm two weeks away from being 69 years old. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Never miss the birthday.